Hello and welcome to the Crochet Circle podcast. I'm Faye and this is my monthly crochet podcast with a little bit of knitting on the side. You can catch the audio version of the podcast on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify and lots of other podcast platforms. The video version is available on YouTube. Each podcast has full linked show notes which can be found at www thecrochetcircle.podbean.com and you can also follow me on Instagram crochet underscore circle underscore podcast Welcome to the Crochet Clan and our amazing community Hello and welcome to episode 52 of the Crochet Circle podcast This one is called Radical Kindness Hello, hello, how are y'all doing? Hope you're well I was going to record yesterday but I just wasn't feeling it and I'm much happier today. Sometimes I go to record and my energy levels just aren't quite right and, you know, I could be feeling more positive. And I always think on the times when I've left it too late and I'm not happy with recording, it shows and it comes across in the podcast. So I always like to wait until I know that I'm kind of up and bouncy and happy, happy, joy, joy, like I usually am, but some days you just... Some days I just don't want to record. <laughs> that was yesterday. Today, however, happy to record. So hello. Um, I'm waving. What have I got for you this month? Um, we have old dog new tricks, including the Crochet Clan um, tip in there. Final destination, which I am wearing. And um, designs in progress. And quick news beats and a big up. And it's a very random big up this this uh, month <laughs> it's a bit woo I'm going a bit woo on you this month for big up um right shall we just uh, get on with it old dog new tricks the um top tip this month from a crochet clan member actually comes from Rika who is on Ravelry and also on Instagram and on Ravelry she's wool around the world and on Instagram she is wool around the world. I've linked to um her on in the show notes so you can catch them there. And um Rika came to, came up with a really good point and one that I hadn't really thought about before and that is that when you crochet a stitch in rows, if you then crochet it in rounds, it looks completely different. For, um, for many stitches and the examples that she put in the thread are for um, I think it's lemon peel stitch and also for feather stitch so I'll attach photos and pop them into the show notes because she also really helpfully provided photos of it in the round and also in rows and they are completely different um, stitches when you see the two together and what's interesting is I actually prefer most stitches when you do them in the round to when you do them in rows. Um, so what that actually means is if you are like designing something or you um, are looking at a stitch dictionary, and I'll come on to those in a minute, that what you see is generally presented in rows rather than in rounds. Um, and therefore you might be able to complete to create something that is completely different if it's something that you're going to do in the round but equally if you've gone to your stitch dictionary and you're working on something that is um, meant to be in the round and you've only seen it in rows then it's going to look totally different and you might be a little bemused by the fact that it just looks nothing like the stitch dictionary is actually um, showing you when I come to designs in progress in a little bit, I'll be able to show you some of the difference that that makes um, because I'm working on two different projects using herringbone stitches, one's in rows and one's in rounds. So I'll be able to show you very clearly what the differences are. Um, but it's just really interesting to see how the same stitch can be completely redefined depending on how you're going to work it. Um, and it's made me think, like from a design point of view, it's made me think more deeply about what stitches could do and what they could look like, because there's a whole world out there that maybe my 
my little pea brain hadn't actually contemplated. So uh, thank you for that, Rika. That is a really good uh, tip, particularly if you're like a budding designer or you want to start out. Or if you're like me, you're somebody who just has to play around with patterns, that you can't just do what you're told. <laughs> or as we'd say in Scotland, do what you're told. If you can't do what you're told, then frankly, this might be a really good option for you because you might want to change things up. So leading on from that, I also thought it might be quite interesting to show you what my favourite stitch dictionaries are. This is something that a Crochet Clan member, Dom, asked me about. And so what I'm holding up is my absolute favourite stitch dictionary. It is called the Crochet Stitch Bible. It's by Betty Barnden. This one was actually given to me, but it came from one of the secondhand booksellers um, on Amazon. It came from Bishop Chalner School Library to begin with. It's even got the old library ticket on it. And what I particularly love about it is that it's got a ring binder to it. So when I open it up and I'm working from the stitch dictionary, it actually stays on page where it is, where it's meant to be. For every single stitch, it is also um, charted out. The instructions are really clear and it gives you a stitch key down the side as well. This is the first ever stitch dictionary that I got my hands on and I just I really love it. It's, um, it's like my go-to pick up. The pictures are also really clear for each of the stitch definitions and it breaks it up into categories. So it goes through basic stitches, textured stitches, fans and shells, Mesh and feely, open work lace, trims and edgings, clusters, puffs and bubbles, spike stitches, relief stitches, Tunisian stitches, multicoloured pattern squares, shapes and motifs and also special stitches. So you've got 230 pages of loads and loads of different stitches in there. What I would say is this is quite an old book now. Um, you can still get copies of it. Like I say, second hand, is, it's not difficult to pick up and you still get ring bound copies of it. But what you might find are some of the stitches used have got different names elsewhere. So for instance, one of um, kind of one of our favorite crochet stitches is linen stitch, but in here I think it's called moss stitch. I've also seen it referred to as tweed stitch. So that's just one thing to look out for. Yeah, this, um, this book is 16 years old, so great stitch dictionary if you're in um, and looking for one. I'll add uh, all of the details, including the ISBN for it, in the show notes in case you want to try and chase one down yourself. But if you're looking to not part with a load of cash and you just are fancying a stitch dictionary, this is always my go-to. I have other ones as well. Got a really lovely one which Sarah Hazel did. I like that one too. But this one with the ring binder just puts it into another another class. I, I love this stitch dictionary. Oh my god, it's like Ravelry. Stitch dictionary, Ravelry. The other one that I wanted to show you is one that just came out last year and it's by Dora Orenstein. And again, this is really helpful if you are um, a budding designer or you like to mock about with other people's patterns um, and the reason that I love this one in particular is because she shows you 125 stitches but she shows it in three different ways for each one so what you get are examples of how to increase and decrease at the edges and how to do the straight stitch right the way up and that kind of information if you're looking at starting out designs is absolutely invaluable because essentially it means that Dora has done the work for you. So if you're doing garments or you are looking at making your own garments up, this is a really good book to get your hands on. Um, it's really well set out. Again, it is charted. You've got full pictures in there. You've got a full text. So depending on if you prefer charts or text, you are covered. And it just has a bit of everything in there. And as you would expect from Dora, it's very comprehensive, it's nicely laid out, it's colourful, the pictures are good. It's just really, it's a lovely book. Um, I know that quite a few of the Crochet Clan already got their hands on this because um, it was available on pre-order um, towards last year. If you're looking for a copy, I've already got these in the shop. I thought it was good enough that I wanted to sell it. 
um, which is how I deal with books in the shop. Basically, I get one in. If I think it's good enough, then it goes on to the shelves and I sell it. And if I don't think it's good enough, then it doesn't get anywhere near the shop because I won't. Like, I can't stand behind it and say it's a good product. This one I really love. So if you're in the market for stitch dictionaries and you want just a basic first go-to one, then the Crochet Stitch Bible is a great one for you. And if you're looking for something that's a little bit more advanced where you're going to do increases, decreases and some slightly more advanced stitches, then Crochet Every Way Stitch Dictionary from Dora Orenstein is the next kind of the next step up that I would encourage you to do but going back to Rika's point with both of these books all of the samples are worked flat so in rows it'd be interesting to see what would happen with these stitches if they were worked up in rounds it would completely change the look of the crochet stitches that is all dog new tricks for this month thank you Rika um, I've got so many suggestions in the Ravelry thread. If you've got your own top tip that you want to share with the Crochet Clan, go to Ravelry and there is a thread there for top tips. Add it in there. And you'll see every time that I'm using um, some days, I just go in and I edit and I see which month it's been used. So if you wanted to go back and see the original post that somebody sent me, then you can go and do that and you can see what it was that they've said so for instance with Rika's one I've already put in bold at the bottom March 2020 so you know when it's been used in the podcast in case you want to come and find it in each podcast as well so thank you very much for that so on to finished objects I'm wearing my finished object for this month I only have one and that's because it's a garment and it's a bit of a whopper this took about 530 grams of DK um, wool. And it is my Adelong sweater, which is designed by Adidas Designs, which is Diane. I really enjoyed working on this project. I'm going to step back a little um, from here and from the mic to try and show it off. I will also add some photos because you can't see everything. Basically, I've just given a really narrow shot for the podcast this month because I have got, I've got crap all the way around me. We're coming back into show season. I haven't put stuff, I haven't put everything away from the Waltham Abbey show. The next one is this weekend, and um, yeah, I'm literally I've got like a little foot space that I can get into to record the podcast. It's all an illusion. There's just rubbish everywhere. But, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll put some proper photos up into uh, the show notes. Hopefully I'll get Matthew to take some for me that I'm happy with. I wore this yesterday. I'm wearing it again today. It seems to be wearing really well. Um, and, yeah, I love it. It's a very wearable piece and it's snug warm as well. Um, but because it's three quarter length sleeves, I'm not actually overheating in it, which is really quite nice. The yarn that I used is actually 100% wool. It's Erica Knight's British Blue 100. And the colourway is, um, it's, I mean, <laughs> there's no other way to describe it. It's mustard. Uh, it's called Mrs Dalloway and it is a proper mustard colour. And a uh, quick shout out and hello to all you other mustard lovers, like Gillian, who's a mustard lover. The best colour ever, basically. So, um, the... The, the jumper is top down. What's interesting about it is the construction starts with the collar. It's a little kind of almost roll neck collar to it. And then you move on to the neck. But as you're working the neck, you're going back and forth. And at the same time, you're working up your arms. And what I particularly love is as you're doing them in short rows, you get this really nice seeming detail coming down the arm piece as you work it up so it's not a standard um, construction in that way but you get a nice fitted piece and if you're a long-term viewer and a listener of the podcast you know that I have um, usually got issues I've got quite I've got quite muscular arms and quite often in jumpers they can just be too tight in my underarm and I hate that claustrophobic feeling in my oxters didn't have that problem with this jumper and I also, I did a size medium and I wouldn't classify myself as a size medium. I'm, I would say that I'm a large, I'm a kind of, on my top, I'm a 14 to 16. 
um, but a size medium with a four millimeter hook worked perfectly for me for gauge and getting enough space underneath my underarms without it being too baggy. So I've got a nice fit, but it's not too baggy and it's not too tight. Um, it's worked back and forth to get this nice ribbed effect up to just above my um, my chest and then you go down and you stop working in ribs <coughs> and it's half trebles, so half doubles, American terminology and then some ribbing at the bottom. I made a couple of changes, nothing too drastic. The um, One of the reasons I went for a size medium is because if I had gone with a larger size I really feel like it would have just hung off my chest and I, I'm not a massive fan of that look on me. I don't think it's flattering. I don't want to put all of that effort into making something that I'm then not happy with the fit in. Um, and when I then tried it on, I wanted to cinch it in a little bit more on the waist. So I did some rounds of decreasing once I'd got um, kind of just past my bust. So that decreased in and it kind of cinches in a little into my waist and then goes down to a ribbing band. The other difference that I made with the ribbing band is I shortened it so it's actually um, the same number of stitches front and back whereas in Deanne's she's got longer rib at the back, shorter at the front and they're not joined and I wanted to keep it a little bit tighter on my hips so I did just a few stitches where I joined the front and the back rib together. Um, I'm going to provide photos of all of this, I've already taken them, I'll pop them into the show notes and also I'll pop them up on the screen as well. Um, so was that it? And there, my other final thing was when I tried it on, I the the sleeve was a little bit flappy. I think in part because I probably should have made the, street, the sleeve longer, which would have made it um, a little bit tighter. But I like the length that it is on me. And um, so the way that I got around that is I just did two quick rounds of double crochet. That pulled it in enough that um, it means I've kneaded off the sleeve end for um, the way that I'd crocheted it. And it also is just enough that it means I don't have like, that bell shape coming off the sleeve cap, which that, I mean, that is just not a style thing that I like. I'm not a fan of like ruffles and bell sleeves and bell caps and ugh, no plain 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 is what I like um so it it does that it neatens off um the way that I'd done the edging and it just pulls the sleeve in enough but without giving it a defined rib or anything else I did try a rib to begin with and I just I didn't like it so I went back to just like I say these two rows of double crochet single crochet US and I love it really like it so warm, lovely, easy to do, um, but I needed 600 grams to go at this. Like I say, I think the finished object is somewhere between about 530 and 540 grams. So it's quite a commitment um, in terms of yarn budget, but it's worth it. I have a very wearable sweater. I really love it. Um, yeah. I haven't written up show notes yet for Ravelry. I will get round to that. I just I just don't I don't know when, let's be truthful. We are currently doing a load of work on the house and so any spare time that I've got in the moment is taken up with painting, tiling, decorating, cleaning, gardening, everything. So um yeah, like getting stuff up into Ravelry is not my priority at the moment but I'll see if I can get something up there at least so I can give you a point at you even if it's just a few bullet points on the changes that I made um but yeah house is coming first at the moment which is quite tiring <laughs> really quite tiring um celery that's what you get when you're a house owner right so I think yeah that's it for um finished objects because I just was powering through with this jumper I I'd made a commitment to you all last month that I would have it finished and I would be wearing it. So here we are. Next up, rather than on routes, I have got designs in progress. It's interesting, I got a note from um, my friend Lisa, who's Lisa Raspberry Crochet, and she was like, I miss your designs in progress. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting, it's lovely. And it's also interesting because 
One of the reasons I stopped showing them so much is because I felt like I was never getting them to the point of fruition. Like, it felt like I was talking about a lot of designs and never quite getting them to the point where there was a pattern there and it just felt a little, not insincere, but like, um, like I was never getting to the end goal. So there's that and also the fact that um, I've been doing a load of commissions and submissions and you're not allowed to show them basically so if you're submitting to a magazine or um, a yarn brand by and large you don't talk about them because the minute you do that's it the design is out they don't want to use it so they want something that's top like top secret that they can do a big ta-da over so that's the other reason why I've not been showing you stuff because there's so much stuff in the pipeline I've got good things to show you next month I really do I'm very excited about that so um, that's one of the reasons I haven't actually been able to show you some of the designs in progress there's been a lot going on behind the scenes but I've not been able to show you them here however I do have uh, three <laughs> that I can show you this month um, the first one you can already, if you're watching, you can see it on my beautiful mannequin Claude. Um, it's a little cowl. Um, so I've been working this up um, in different sizes. Um, some of you may be aware of Operation Social Justice Warrior. And that's what this cowl is for. Frankly, I'm not a fan of online bullying. I am not a fan of people naming yarns in a manner that know when they know it's going to cause people harm, when it's going to cause my friends harm and I know it's caused them harm and I know that um, emotionally they've had to deal with somebody, frankly, being really insensitive. I'm not a fan of that. So Angie and Sarah at Gamer Crafting came up with an opposing view, which was to run a project called Operation Social Justice Warrior. And the premise of it is that there are over 185 different businesses now that have pulled together um, projects, ideas, so it might be yarn dyers, they might be stitch marker makers, designers, you name it, there's everything in there. And we are all working towards making different things. And on the 15th of March at 12 p.m. GMT, it goes live across all of our different websites. So I've provided links in the show notes because Angie has pinpointed you or will be pinpointing you to all of the different websites and what is available. And if you want to see what all of the different people are doing globally, you can have a look on Instagram and look for hashtag Operation SJW because there are some amazing things going on there. And uh, yeah, I want to take part. And that's why this episode is called Radical Kindness, because that is their take on it. They would rather have radical acts of kindness than behaviour that isn't befitting our fibre community and doesn't actually treat humans in a humane way, in my opinion. And so I wanted to turn that on its head and be part of that positivity every inch of the way and talking of positivity um, one of the things that I have done is a design which is called positivity spiral it's a crochet design and it uses um, three very simple stitches that are worked up into a cowl and again the premise of this cowl is you can do it in any weight yarn you can use 50 grams you can use 100 grams you can use up scraps you can um, find a fabric density that you like by varying your hook size. So long as you um, chain up the right number of stitches to begin with, you can really make this your own. And Positivity Spiral, as a design, actually works around in a spiral. So the stitch that I've chosen is Herringbone Treble, which naturally wants to lie to the left, especially if you do it in the round. I'll show you when... Um, when I get to the next project and also the filet crochet that stacks up on top of it in steps also naturally wants to sit to the left so what that means is you get this lovely spiraled effect as you work in the rounds and go all the way up 
So the one that I'm showing up is actually in a sport with yarn. It's in John Arbon Textiles Alpaca Supreme. And it just the drape, the softness, it's really quite luxurious. It's just beautiful. And you can start and stop on this cowl whenever you like. It's actually quite big already. And I still have about 20 grams still to add to this. It was a 100 gram skein. It's lovely and um, like textured and soft, but also warm around my neck. Um, so you can make it shorter if you want. You can make it bigger. You could go with a heavier weight yarn and a smaller hook size and make it denser so that it sits up more proudly. I've ultimately gone for drape and something that will sit nicely on the back of my neck. You could decrease the number of patterns so that it was tighter around your and um, pattern repeats so it was tighter around your neck. You could increase the number of pattern repeats so that you can double it over and wear it as a double cowl as well. It's really open to your own interpretation. This is Positivity Spiral. So I'm showing you this one because what's actually going to happen is so that on Saturday I'm down at the Rivernet's Open Day Vending and there's a very special dyer that's going to be there um, and that is Ishrat from Fruitful Fusion Dyes and Ishrat is also taking part in Operation Social Justice Warrior and she is going to have some yarn that she's dyed I'm going to buy a skein from her and the one that will be in the pattern, the initial pattern is actually going to be in Ishrat's yarn. And that was a really important point for me. I wanted to work in collaboration. I wanted to do this design in a manner that shows inclusivity and diversity rather than just me in my office designing something up again. I want to be able to show off Ishrat's colours and her beautiful dyeing. So um, that's another key part of um, Operation Social Justice Warrior for me and the other fact is my lovely lovely tech editor Deb has said that she is going to tech edit for me for free I didn't ask her to do it she just she saw I was doing the design on Instagram and she emailed me straight away and said I'll tech edit for free let me let me support so what I'm actually going to do because most folk are um, giving 20% of the profit to different charities. Now, because mine is a design, so if tech editing is paid for, then it's just my time that I'm putting in and purchasing the yarn from Ishrat. They are my only costs for this design. Um, apart from like website, I have costs for that and for Ravelry. So what that allows me to do is actually do 100% of the profits from this pattern for a specific period of time are going to go straight to Rota, which is a think tank. It's called Race on the Agenda, and it's a UK-based think tank. And basically, they work towards... Actually, let me, let me read it, because I don't want to misrepresent what it is that they um, do. Race on the Agenda is one of Britain's leading social policy think tanks focusing on issues that affect black, Asian and minority ethnic BAME um, communities. Originally set up in 1984, Rota aims to increase the capacity of BAME organisations and strengthen the voice of BAME communities through increased civic engagement and participation in society. And that for me felt like the perfect way of me getting involved and trying to make a difference. So 100% of the profits of every pattern of positivity spiral between the 15th of March and the end of March will be going straight to Rota. I'm really pleased about that. Um, and what that means is it's going to be available 12 o'clock on the 15th on my Ravelry on um, my website and also on Etsy. Now, if you're somebody that wants to be able to support, but um, you might be on a lower income, you might have, you know, pledged support elsewhere, please remember that I also have um, pattern pricing on my website. So if you buy an electronic copy of any of my patterns, you can purchase them from £2 
three pounds, four pounds, which is the normal pattern price, five or six. So whatever your budget is, you can actually buy one of my patterns at any of those prices. I don't vet, I don't ask questions, but if you want access to my patterns at a lower price, that is the place to go to, to be able to do that. So if you wanted to buy the pattern, but you also wanted to buy yarn or stitch markers or something from somebody else, then I would say, go to my website, get the pattern um, at whatever price you can pay and 100% of the profits are going to Rota. So, I've shown you the Alpaca Supreme one. Next month I'll be able to show you the one with um, Ishrat's beautiful colours. I, I know what she's planning and it's going to be beautiful. On Claude, I also have another... Oh, oh, this is amazing. It's also very drapey. It's... Um, 50% alpaca, 50% silk. I should have said, sorry, the alpaca supreme one that I've just shown is a is a beautiful um, caramelly fawn colour. It's really lovely. But the one that I'm holding up now, which is just 50 grams, is a colourry... It's a yarn brand, which is Blue Sky Alpacas. And the one, the kind of brand category is called Metallico and um it's a silvery color it's just it's so beautiful i bought this when i was in munich at demersary and it was one of those i thought i'd bought all the things that i wanted and then i saw this on the table and it was just like oh, i have to have you but it's been sat in my stash for what three years now four years three years and um i got two skeins and this is 50 grams so i just I don't know whether to use up another gram of my precious Metallico um, and just add a second skein to it or just keep it as one as a little low-level cowl. But it's so luxurious. It's just warm and soft and, oh, love it. Really love it. Um, and it feels good to have been using up one of those precious skeins as well. So I think I probably will add the second one into it and then I've just got one big project that I think I'll get... A lot of wear out of especially kind of spring autumn time when you just when you want to keep the back of your neck warm if ever I'm really chilly keeping the back of my neck warm makes quite a difference to my overall body temperature so that is example number two now the other thing I would also say about this is um, I'm going to be working this up in DK and Aaron possibly in a freaking lace weight <laughs> I will go heavily this way. I'm not doing 800 metres per 100 grams. Um, but I'm going to be working it up in different um, weights of yarn as well. So when I've done all of that, the initial pattern will come out with whatever it is that I've already done on it. And as I add more weights of yarn to it, I will update the pattern. So even if you are one of the first people to buy it, I will then be sending out updated patterns from my website, from Etsy and from Ravelry. So if you buy it now then you will get eventually all of the details with all of the different yarn weights on it as well. With hook sizes, tension, kind of what I did. The basic recipe that I used for each one to make it longer, make it shorter, make it narrower, make it deeper. So luxurious. But that can go back on Claude. So, that was design in progress number one. Number two is a blanket. I have never designed a blanket before, which I find a little odd, but I have never designed a blanket anymore. And this one is 100% inspired by all of those yarn advent calendars that everybody was getting in December. I had some real jealousy over that. Um, it's not something that I've ever done because sometimes the colours that I've found in them um, when friends have had them I've been like eh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want that I wouldn't use that colour but then my friend Beck had one in December and hers was from Bernie at Bear in Sheep's, Bear in Sheep's Clothing and it was amazing Bernie's colours just are amazing they're very much in my if I ever go to a pastel kind of a colour it's because it's Bernie's done something um, she just she nails the earthy end of pastel for me. 
Um, so, inspired by that, but without the budget, and I'm on a yarn ban until the end of January 2021, I thought, well, I have a lot of stash, and I have a lot of partial balls of yarn, because I make socks and shawls, and you end up with little bits and pieces. So what I did was I took to my stash, and I looked for anything that was a four-ply, and had 20 grams or more in it. And I picked out 24 colours. You would not believe the number of hours I spent on this trying to line them all up and make sure that I had the right colour combinations in there and that it would flow from one colour to the next, to the next, to the next. Hours over Christmas doing this. However, I finally got there. And you don't necessarily have to put all of those hours in, but if you've got lots of yarn scraps like I had... You can maybe be a bit more hodgepodge about it, but my very pedantic brain would not allow that to happen. That's that's just not... No, no, no. <laughs> there has to be order. Chaos is not allowed as far as I'm concerned. So you could just go and get anything that is 20 grams or more, or you can do what I do, which is pick them out, get 24 cakes of 20 grams plus, and get them into a number sequence. Then what you do is you get yourself... 24 brown paper bags um, I've actually written on each bag what the yarn was because um, I can remember them all <laughs> I typed this in a message to some friends I was like I can't remember what I just went upstairs for but I can tell you in a bag of maybe 50, 60 scraps of cakes of yarn I can tell every single Pretty much colourway. I certainly know where I bought it. I know who the yarn dyer was. I can tell you all of that. But why I've just gone upstairs to do something? Not a clue. I think I've got my priorities right though. It's all about yarn. So um, you get brown paper bags. And you put your nuggets into the paper bags. So obviously I'm already working on this design. So number nine. Which is what I'm holding up in the brown paper bag is cope knits and I know that it's 420 meters per 100 grams and so that's the one that I'm working on at the moment but then beside me is labeled up number 10 and I haven't got a clue what's in here I've already forgotten what the different colorways were so as soon as I finish number nine then I will be going to number 10 but equally you could be opening these up every single day in December especially if you do it now because you will forget what you've put away for this blanket you don't even have to do it for the blanket you can just give yourself your own advent and use what you've got and use what is already in your stash and I love that idea so I'm going to peek in and see what's in number 10 it says Siddhartha 400 meters for 100 grams and I've got 21 grams of it aha yes so this is beautiful it's quite a um, sage green going into quite a limey green colour. And let me just pick up. It is Sudegard Silky Swiss Gorgeousness. And it's 50% silk, 50% merino. And this was actually a nugget that I got from Rachel. It was part of a fibre share pack. So this is going into my blanket. So that is number 10. And then in my stash palace, I have got 11 through to 24 ready to keep on adding to my blanket. So let me pop them away. And then I can show you the blanket. So the colour that I'm currently working on, which is the Coop Knits, is this lovely deep tealy forest green colour. And what I am doing with the blanket is basically... It's herringbone half treble, so herringbone half double in US terminology. And what that means is what you get from herringbone half treble and trebles is a really flat fabric. It's not really holy like trebles are or half trebles can be. So um, because it's got an extra step in the stitch, it kind of fills in that gap of where the hole would normally be. But it's flat, it's not dense, and you just get this really usable fabric from it. And it's light, but it allows your yarn to go quite a long way. So for blankets, it's a really good stitch. And because it's herringbone and it's been worked in 
rows so flat you get this lovely herringbone effect on the diagonals with it going from one to the other so I have been working up from my um, scrap it doesn't look that great at the moment I have to admit but I know it's going to because I know all of the colours are coming through so it's starting out with a kind of salmony pink uh, co-op knits and then it's moving into bed and sheep's clothing which is a cream colour with the same hints of pink below and then it's moving up to a kind of dirty ecru colour which is also represented in the yarn below so this is what I'm seeing about kind of colour matching then it's fjord fibres which has got the same kind of dirty ecru in it and then up into um, a kind of a peachy brown colour which again is represented in the colour below and then a grey with the same peachy brown which has got hints of mustard which I've then added in the next one up and then a green which has got flecks of mustard in it again and then a very similar the co-op green that I've just talked about is in there and is the next one so the other thing that you can see that I'm doing is going from a solid variegated solid variegated solid variegated solid variegated solid and I've kept that sequence right the way through my 24 um, different colours and it's just a quick six row repeat I'm getting quite a sizable blanket out of it it's probably about 1.3 meters in length at the moment and then I'm going to add a border around it which is in uh, an ecru colour because I just think that that ecru colour is going to pick up well with all of the colours that I've got in the blanket so far and uh, without jarring with it it's not going to be competing with some of the colours so that's going to be the border again straight out stash so if you want to add a border at the moment I reckon you need about 100 grams if you're going to do that so I'm going to continue with this um, project it's called the scrap vent blanket and um, I'll I, th I think I'll probably just keep on showing it to you as I've done a little bit more work on it so you can see how it's um, forming and how the different colours are working but like I say you wouldn't have to just do this if you're doing this um, blanket you could pull together your own um, s advent colours from your own stash and then come December you don't feel like you're missing out you don't have FOMO over other people's advent your invents because you have your own but it's cost you nothing I mean it costs you the initial thing but it's stuff that's just sat in your stash I think it's a great idea it costs you basically 24 um, brown paper bags that's it so oh actually I meant to show you and I'll take photos and add these into the show notes I'm hoping I can show you the difference between herringbone half treble worked in rows gives you that diagonal what you would expect in herringbone and that diagonal almost tweedy effect. The cowl is herringbone trebles and you don't get that um, tweed effect because all of your diagonals are always running in one way. So whilst this is treble and the cowl is treble and the blanket is half treble actually that is the difference between working in rows and working in the round you get a completely different stitch by working in the round it lies differently it performs differently it actually feels more squishy worked in the round as well um, like I say I'll add photos so you can see the two side by side right Design in progress number three. Let me just pop all of this away. So this is one that you might recognise. I think I spoke about it a couple of podcasts ago. Um, I worked on a design um, two and a half years ago. See, this is why I don't show designs off in progress anymore. Because <laughs> I'm crap. Um... It was going to be called Barley and it uses puff stitches up against a semi-solid colour and originally it was done with jewel tone minis from River Knits and I really loved it but then when 
Becky and Marcus brought out their Chimera colourway, which has got so many different colours in it, I thought, right, I can rework that pattern, finally get it out and get it doing something and show um, off Chimera when it's put up against a semi-solid and it is just gorgeous. So Chimera is, um, it almost looks like hand-spun yarn, it's really beautiful. But it's got teal in there, mustard, and you never know which two colours are going to be applied together. So every single stitch is completely different. And that really shows in the little sample that I'll take photos of and, and show off. Every puff stitch is completely different from the next. And it looks fab against the navy semi-solid colour that I'm using. So whilst I'm at the very beginning of this design, this is actually going to be... A pair of mittens, a cowl, and also a hat design. And I, I don't know yet whether I would put them all into one pattern, which would make a more expensive pattern. But interested to hear your thoughts on that. Would you rather have a separate pattern, like one for mittens, one for a cowl, one for a hat? Or would you rather have a better priced pattern that covered all three? I don't know which to do on that front, but um, that's where I'm heading to, basically. So it's going to be a little while until this is done because, um, well, just because life is busy and we're we're dealing with house stuff, which I wasn't really expecting, but we are, and um, yeah. So this this will this will be a bit like the blanket. Every time we've done a little bit of something, I'll just I'll show it off and show it as a design in progress. So it'd also be interesting. Like, do you care if it takes me months to get a pattern out? I mean, it's a really involved process, so it's not something that I can quickly rapidly do in a week or so but do you care would you rather just see what I'm working on again like answers on a postcard let me know because I'm more than happy to show off what my designs are if I can I just was feeling really guilty that so many of them weren't weren't getting to the point of publish as quickly as I wanted them to so yeah let me know if you care about that or if you're just if you just like to see the process some fo some folk just enjoy seeing the process and getting a little sneaky peek of what's been going on behind the scenes um i'm not sure what these are going to be called in the end i might stick with barley because they are like barley ears going up which i love um yeah i don't know i might i don't know what the answer is i will i will find out maybe when i've finished the design off at that point i get to name them it's like a little treat so moving on to quick news beats um, the next Global Hookup is going to be on Saturday the 21st of March at 8 o'clock GMT and on Sunday the 22nd at 9am GMT. The um, the number, the access code to get into Zoom is on the Ravelry page. I also, um, as soon as I've published the podcast, I now put the um, global hookup information straight up onto Instagram stories and I add it to a highlight so if you ever need a quick reference of where um, where the information the code the timings are the easiest way if you're on Instagram is probably to go straight to at crochet underscore circle underscore podcast and look into the highlights for global hookup because the information is there um yeah so it'd be lovely to see you there. We've got a really lovely core group of people coming in and um, it's such a lovely friendly space and helpful and very sharing and, you know, full of ideas and people showing off their their crochet and their objects and their yarn and whatever it is they're working on. It's Yeah, it's a really lovely space. So everybody is welcome and you're very welcome to come in and keep the keep yourself muted if you don't want to join in but just be part of a crafting space and equally you're very welcome to come and pop a sticker over your um, video or not have your video function on so that you can just be part of it and again you don't have to be seen so it's totally up to you how you interact with the space but it's there for you if you want it if you just if you just want to be with some fellow crafters for a little while or you just want to dip in and see what we're about, you're very welcome to come and join. Um, the final one that I want to go on quick news beats 
this is going to go live on the 6th of March and therefore tomorrow, if you're watching on the 6th, I will be at the River Knits Open Day Weekend, which is on the 7th and it's at Weedenbeck. Information is on their website if you want to come and say hello. So many amazing people are going to be there. Um, so obviously Becky and Marcus, Katie Greenbeam will be there. Um, Ishrap Fruitful Fusion Dyes, you and Ply will be there. Uh, Johnny from Garth Ennard will be there. Sharon and Andy from um, Dragon Hill Studios. There's just so many lovely folk. Um, and it's hotting up to be a really amazing day. And it sounds like oh, the best grilled cheese sandwiches are going to be available to buy. So, yum. with all of the proceeds going to a food bank. So, yeah, it's going to be a cracking day. I'm very much looking forward to it. A um, couple of other places I'm going to be kind of um, in the coming months. I have got Wonderful Wheels, which I'm vending at again. Favourite show ever. And that is the 25th and 26th of April. And um, that's in Mid Wales. I'm also doing the Knit and Stitch show up at the Regged Centre in Cumbria. That's a new show for me. So if you're up that way, come and say hello. Um, and I'll also be doing Yarningham in Birmingham, which is on the 11th and 12th of July. So... Um, I'm looking forward to that because I've never done that show either and I've been to it, really enjoyed it and um, yeah, I'll be there vending this year which is very exciting, bringing my wares. Um, there are loads of other events that I'm going to be at throughout the year, I'm just not allowed to tell you which they are because they tend to do like a big thing on social media to see who it is that's coming to their event and we're all basically on closed mouths, zipped mouths until... Um, they've announced and then once they've announced we can say that we're going to be there so they're the ones I can tell you about so far lovely to see some of you at events um, I know you can't all travel the country and I know many many of my listeners and watchers are actually in America and Canada and Germany and Iceland and all over the place and you're unlikely to be coming to events um, but you can still look in on the event um instagram feeds and see what's going on because we have so many yarn events in the uk where we are yarn um event heavy i think my final one is big up and i told you at the beginning this is going to be about woo and it really is um i am going to big up the moon <laughs> I know, some of you are listening and watching thinking, have you totally lost the plot? But it has taken me 40, almost 43 years to work out the impact that the moon's lunar cycle has on me as a creative in particular. This is what's really struck this chord with me. And I thought I'd mention it because I was speaking with um, Hayley, who was just feeling overly tired the other day. And I was like, have you maybe thought it might be the moon so bear with me what I'm finding is happening now that I'm tracking it and I'm understanding it is in the days leading up to a new moon and the immediate few days afterwards I am absolutely shattered like I need to take uh like <laughs> I've started calling them new moon naps in the afternoon because I can barely function my creativity just falls off a cliff I feel really downhearted about my creativity as well. That's the time where my self-doubt really creeps in and I'm just like, why am I doing this? What am I thinking I can be a creative person for? Why am I designing? I'm rubbish. My life is rubbish. <laughs> it's the new moon. And I'm now that I'm starting to recognise that, I can kind of counteract it and go, well, you, you know what phase we're in and that's what's happening. The corollary to that is when it comes to being a full moon and there's more light, I am bursting with ideas and energy. And again, a good few days in the lead up over the um, full moon and a few days afterwards. And I am just like, ding, ding, ding. My receptors are going. I'm just like idea after idea after idea after idea. And I just can't stop myself. And it must annoy my friends because I'm just like, what about this? And we could do this together. Have you thought about this idea? And what about this? And what um, what we could do a collaboration on this? Because there are literally like noodles of ideas coming out of my head. Um, 
and I am bursting with energy. And then the times in between, kind of either side of the new moon and the full moon, it's just business as usual. <laughs> I can just crack on with stuff normally. Um, I just thought I would mention it because there might be a few of you that haven't made the correlation to the lunar cycle and what it does to you. And especially if you're a creative, like that point of falling off and thinking where's it all gone and just really going through a period of self-doubt and then to that point of it coming straight back up like a rocket when you get into the full, full moon cycle is just, it's incredible. I've been tracking it for maybe about four to six months now and it is like I could set my body clock by it as to what's going to happen and then if I know it I can recognise it and I can try and level out the the rubbishy bits a little bit more but yeah a little bit woo but it might be helpful for some of you even if you know from a point of tiredness and then energy levels and trying to mask that out so what I now do is plan my month around where I'm going to be according to new moon and full moon so there is no point in me trying to think up new ideas when I'm in a new moon phase that's when I just need to crack on and do the things that I thought about in the last um, full moon phase. So the uh, positivity spiral cow, that was last full moon phase. That's when that came. And then I've been working on it in this um, new moon phase that we've just come through. And then next week we're into another full moon. So I'm getting ready for ramping up and thinking about the next set of designs. An odd one, but a big up. Big up the moon. Honestly, it's not mumbo jumbo. It 100% has an effect. And I've checked in with loads of other creatives. And and they might be yarn dyers, illustrators, you name it. They feel the same pull of the moon. They they have the same dip and, and kind of peaks and troughs with it. And they're, they also find the difference between full moon and new moon. Might be helpful for some of you might just be a bit woo for some of you as well right I think that is me done it's a bit of a short one this month like I say working on uh, the big project that was add along designs in progress and also the house is one massive uh, kind of work in progress at the moment the garden really needs tending to because basically I've spent the last two years crocheting and ignoring the fact that anything green survives outside of our house so it's time to put it into that um, which might mean that because I have to work on that it might just mean that podcasts are a little bit shorter because my hours are spent out there and on the house and also I just might not be as available on social media because I have to prioritise the house at the moment so uh, yeah apologies for that but such is life sometimes other things just have to happen so that is my priority right we are done. When am I coming back? When when do I get to record again? I am next seeing you on the 3rd of April. So, Friday, Friday the 3rd of April, I'll be back with the next instalment of the Crochet Circle podcast. Thank you very much for all of your support and for being such a fabulous crochet clan. See you soon. Bye-bye. Not going to wink this time. I'm not winking. I'm not winking. As ever, thank you for being part of this podcast. Your involvement and being part of the Crochet Clan means an awful lot. If you've enjoyed what you've seen and you want to support the podcast, I have a Kofi account and you can find that simply by searching for the Crochet Circle podcast or you can find links in the show notes. Thank you. Are you recording? Yes, you are. Are you too close? Yes, you are. Back off, microphone. Right. Uh, We can see Claude. We can see me. I have my show notes. Upside down. Stitch by back to you. Let's actually record a podcast. Little Pomeroy's outside in the garden watching me. Hmm.
little beady eyes. Let's see what I'm up to. Oh, 